So Amy, with that in mind, how long does it actually take to develop an asylum application? So we found that an asylum application takes an estimated 50 to 75 hours for an experienced immigration attorney. And it's important to note that you can't do that in one marathon session over coffee. That is that is something that's carried out over months. It requires um, getting evidence from foreign countries that may that may be slow to respond. So some people even cited having to hire attorneys in another country in order to navigate that issue. It requires building a relationship with, with your client um, and really getting their story and their memories and getting it to the point where they can talk about it comfortably because many asylum seekers have experienced pretty significant trauma. So this is not something that you can condense down into like a 50 hour session or even a week. It's something that takes time. Um, some of the complications that, that add significant time to repairing an asylum application include navigating significant trauma and, and having the client be detained throughout the process. Um, those are probably the two most the two most significant complications, but there's others that include language barriers, if you are, or if you're an indigenous language speaker in particular, you can have a difficult time finding a, a translator that has to come into the office and, and work with the lawyer and the client every time that they're meeting to help get their entire, their application together. Uh, when a client is detained, it means attorneys found that Attorneys cited that it can add up to 24 hours of time to a case, and that's because every detention center is different with different processes and procedures, and it can take hours per visit to navigate, and every attorney meets with their client multiple times during this process, and most detention centers are also in a remote area that takes time to travel to, so visiting one client in detention could be an entire day's worth of work. Um, significant trauma can add an estimated 25 to 29 hours to a case, but it's actually more than that because, so that estimate comes from the idea of like having to build a relationship with your client and, and get them to trust you and get and get their story and work and work with them and work through the trauma that they've experienced. But also trauma, uh, asylum applicants that have experienced significant trauma often need psychological testimony and that can, take an additional 18 to 24 hours of time to work with medical professionals to, to get that sort of document to support the, the fact that, there, that the trauma exists, that the, that the trauma has occurred. And so what are some of the implications of these findings? I think the biggest implication is that it's not physically possible to both have meaningful access to an attorney and a timeline that's so expedited that an attorney cannot prepare the case. Uh, one of the things that really stood out to me again and again is how our is how our laws since uh, Real, the Real ID Act, Real ID Act uh, put a lot of emphasis on corroborating evidence, and this is true whether you have two days to prepare your case or five years. So we have the same standard um, for an asylum seeker that that only has two days to gather evidence as we would for someone who has a much longer period of time. And in doing so, we set up asylum seekers to fail um, when we don't give them enough time to prepare their case. One clarifying question coming from the chat, Amy, when you say it takes 50 to 75 hours for your, your average asylum case for an experienced immigration attorney, do you mean an individual or do you mean a family? Um, that's an in, that's an individual, um, but it, it, a fam usually there's a the individual is the primary asylum applicant, and so you're you're focusing most of it around that. But you would still have to prepare, like it would take time to do the forms and the supporting documents that are, that impl implicate the family as well. So, thank you. I want to put Jeremy in the hot seat a little bit. Um, you have over 25 years of experience practicing asylum law. Does the study's time frame line up with your experience? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, my law firm was one of the many that Amy consulted with in the creation of this report. Uh, so we certainly were within the average. Uh, I want to add a little supplement to the question of individual versus family. You know, many times 
to Amy's point, you've got a principal asylum seeker plus derivatives. But most of the time, I am in a defensive asylum setting where a person is seeking asylum before the immigration court. And for withholding and for cat claims, uh, you don't have derivatives. So what we often find we have to do is prepare individualized a- asylum applications for each and every member of that family, uh, and which, of course, adds an incredible amount of time uh, into this process. And as a person with mostly defensive asylum applications practicing in the interior, can you briefly summarize what your process or approach is to preparing an application? Yes. Yeah, so- Okay, so for us, and what I want to point out is the Carolinas, that is a undetained, a non-detained area of the country because the Carolinas uh, had no facilities uh, that have long-term contracts with ICE. North Carolina does not permit private prisons. Uh, So uh, we don't have that. So most of my clients are not detained They've been released into the interior. Um, It starts with the interview. I ask tons of open-ended questions, starting with how can we help you, uh, so that I can get the raw, unedited version of what the person is fleeing from and what those details are in a way that gives no indication as to what my agenda is or what I want them to say. So lots of open-ended questions with follow-ups. If I, now the difference, because in the chat, we've got a a question about affirmative versus defensive. I will tell you that whether I accept the case for representation, uh, I apply two different standards depending on whether it is affirmative versus defensive. If it is affirmative, I need to be very confident that not only is this a a legitimate, bona fide, fraud-free claim, I also need to think that I'm going to win. Uh, Because otherwise, if a person is applying affirmatively for asylum and that person is referred to immigration court instead of their case being accepted by USCIS, then in essence, that person has paid to put themselves into deportation. They've literally paid to put themselves into deportation. So is that a good value proposition for the client, for the consumer? I think about that. And so I have a higher standard on affirmative asylum. For defensive, they are already on the legal chopping block. They are facing exile from this country. What I'm looking at is, is it a approvable case? In other words, is there, an, can I articulate an argument as to how this is uh, a credible fear of persecution on account of one of the five protected grounds uh, as defined by current case law? And do I believe it is uh, legitimate, not fraudulent? If, you can, if it passes those two tests, then I will accept it uh, as a defensive case because that really is their relief before the immigration court. And we start, after we accept a case, we start with the declaration and the basic biographic information to populate the form. And uh, with the creation of the declaration, we basically do it, we ask the clients, the, at least the ones uh, that Uh, can uh, read and write uh, to provide us with a raw statement in their own words as to what they're running from. And then we go back and forth and create it from there. After the declaration, we move to supporting documentation, starting with the first sentence. And going from there, we ask ourselves, can you prove it? You know, I was born in San Salvador. Can you prove it? Et cetera. Uh, And so we and then we go individual out. So are there things that we can corroborate about the person's individual claim? Check off that and then move on to the larger country condition documents that corroborate the person's story, the pattern of, of that particular story and how it plays out in the country. So that's really our process. 
uh, before an interview on an affirmative case or an individual hearing on a, a in a in an immigration court setting. Uh, we also have multiple hearing preps where we just go over things. And of course, that's when interpretation comes in. We've even had cases where we basically have what's called relay uh, translation, where you're going from an indigenous language to Spanish and then Spanish to English. It takes a lot of time. So I want to zoom out a little bit, and, and you're not prepared for this question. I, it's not on our list, but for those lay people in the audience who at a fundamental level might not understand the difference between an affirmative and defensive case, what is the difference there in, in process? How do you end up in an affirmative case versus a defensive case? No, it's a, it's a great, great question. Okay. So if, well, first of all, asylum is about venue. If you're outside of the United States, you're seeking to become a refugee. If you're already in the United States, you're seeking asylum. Uh, so it's the same basic legal definition. If you're in the United States and not caught up in the immigration enforcement apparatus, in other words, uh, you were not detained by Border Patrol. You have not um, been, uh, you know, uh, screened at a port of entry and determined that you didn't have the proper documentation to enter the country. In other words, if you've had no encounter with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and you want to seek asylum, you are doing that affirmatively. If you have gotten caught up in our immigration enforcement apparatus, then you are seeking asylum defensively. So if you think about a criminal case, for example, what's your defense, right? Uh, asylum is your defense from deportation. Thank you so much um, for, for that briefer. So is there a case, you know, thinking about this, all of this time and the effort that has to go into an, into approving an asylum case, is there a particular case that comes to mind when you think of the impact of having to prepare a case really quickly? I, there was a brief period of time uh, where the, I think it was the Obama administration, it's been a little while, that was actually practicing the last in first out policy in a in a very meaningful way and what was happening for for those of you that may not be aware the reason that a person that has applied for asylum can't obtain a work permit until their their application has been pending for 180 days is to provide an opportunity for an asylum adjudicator to uh, not grant that asylum uh, application, to adjudicate that asylum application within the six months. And if that happens, the person does not get a work permit. And so there was a period of time when you were seeing typically interviews happen about six weeks after we submitted the application. Uh, that required us, when you combine that with the fact that we need to file within one year of the person's arrival, that created in many cases a, a, a time crunch um, where we would do the best we could, but clearly the client was being prejudiced. We didn't have time to get an expert. We didn't have time to corroborate as much as we could. Uh, those are the two main things uh, that became shortcomings in those cases where time is short. So you've already touched on this uh, a little bit, and I'm not sure if you've done any work with uh, the new asylum processing rule, but you know, what What would happen if you had to um, prepare a case in 11 days? Is is that at all possible? Um, and Amy, maybe maybe for you, to the extent the audience is not aware of what the asylum processing rule is, do you want to introduce that to, uh, to the group? So uh, in a very short, to, uh, very short gem of an introduction, it is currently paused. They're not currently enrolling new individuals into the rule, but but it, the, uh, there was set timelines where you had to, you would, if you're in different, if you're in expedited removal, so you're at the border, then you get a credible fear very quickly. If you were, if you if you had a positive credible fear, which is like the preliminary interview for an asylum case, um, then you would have the asylum case within another set period of time. 
and that time could be as little as 11 days because you had you had a uh, you had to submit any supporting documents within seven within seven days of the actual interview so for the attorney for all practical purposes you could have 11 days to prepare your case um and i can find some resources for more specifics on that uh, but that is that is that is why that that came up in in, in this issue so so turning back to Jeremy, I think there's this fundamental tension between the desire to provide competent counsel and the desire to help folks in need. Where does that balance sort of land? And what do you think about the ability to competently prepare a case in that short amount of time? I Fortunately, I have never had uh, been forced to prepare an, an application within 11 days. Now, at least a full application. Now, let me, I've had to file 589 applications, bare bones applications in a hurry to meet a particular deadline, but not a fully flesh developed asylum claim. Uh, I view that as impossible unless the adjudicator is meaningfully uh, resting upon the settled regulation that says the asylum seeker's word when credible is good enough. But when do you see that? I, I I hardly have ever seen that in my 26 years of practicing law. Uh, you always need to corroborate and you get the adjudicator ends up, uh, you know, turning, declining your case in part when they see a lack of corroboration. Uh, I just, you can't put those two things together, not 11 days. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, there's this interest in due process and, you know, an individual's right to defend their claim, but also in efficiency. People don't want to be in limbo forever. What, what happens when the opposite is true, when a case takes too long? Do you have examples um, in, in your 26 years of experience that you've seen? No, Alex, that is my practice. That what you just said, that is my practice. Uh, because of, I mean, I have cases that have been pending with USCIS asylum for six years, seven years plus. I have defensive applications that have been pending with the immigration court uh, for five years, six years. It is insane. That is the norm right now. Uh, and it's there's such a combination of reasons for that. I, I, I can put on my uh, ALA executive committee had for all of that. But, uh, you know, there are lots of, of policy and fiscal reasons for that problem. Um, but that's the norm. And it does a disservice to the vast majority of asylum seekers because their evidence gets stale. And I view this most importantly, often the danger is diminished in the eyes of the adjudicator due to an extended period of time. So uh, I've got a case that went to the Fourth Circuit uh, and where we won, fortunately. Uh, but the government's biggest argument in that case was that my a chain circumstance from her claim, which was which was fundamentally domestic violence, that that risk of danger was not there because she had not seen her spouse in over 10 years. Never mind that he stabbed her in the stomach multiple times and almost killed her. But he hadn't seen her in 10 years. Is the danger really there? You know, that was a huge issue in that case. Why? Because it dragged on for so long. Uh, so it's important for our policymakers in this country to try to find a balance a balance between speed and then this protracted limbo that's that thousands and thousands of asylum seekers face every year. And not to mention those individuals who are in fact detained, right? Folks who are in detention centers certainly have a vested interest in um, an efficient process that doesn't have them waiting months, if not years, in detention centers trying to prove their case. I wanted to, to turn back to the kind of step-by-step -step process that you outlined earlier, because there is a question in the chat. 
do you, is that the same process for you for both affirmative and defensive cases, or is that kind of your approach to defensive cases? Uh, no, it's for both. Uh, the, the timing of it, the timing of it, it differs with defensive. So basically with a defensive application, you want to get your uh, application filed uh, and whatever you can support it with, you we support it with. But often, especially in a court like Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, your individual hearing may not happen for two years or three years down the road. And so we are not going to go all in in a hurry uh, to try to fully support and document everything. Uh, we're going to document anything that's time sensitive. But when it comes to, uh, you know, expert testimony or current country conditions, we're going to lean into uh, a time that's closer to that individual hearing date. Now, before we turn back to the report and some of the recommendations um, put forth there, um, Jeremy, if you could wave a magic wand and change just one thing about the asylum application process, what would that be? If it about the asylum application process, I the one thing that I would I would honestly change it's well, Alex, sorry, I'm going to cheat a little. It's not exactly procedural. It's more on the legal front. Uh, having an honest definition of particular social group would include women. I, I, women are a particular social group. Uh, and yet, because there are a lot of women, right, uh, you know, both the agency and courts have not found the group to be particular enough, but that's outrageous because if religion is a particular, I mean, is one of the grounds for asylum uh, that could have millions of people within it. So yeah. I just think we just need to have a little intellectual honesty in that area. And I think that would help everyone involved, every stakeholder involved, including the government. You could certainly write a dissertation on, on that one. Um, turning back to you, Amy, I wanted to comb through some of the recommendations in this report. Can can you touch um, on on some of the recommendations that were made here? So I think um, probably the the one the one thread that goes through all of them is ensuring that there any asylum timelines not timelines do not undermine fairness. If there are processing deadlines, and it, it makes sense why the government wants to have processing deadlines, they should allow adequate time for an asylum seeker to first obtain counsel, which can take time, and then for the attorney to prepare the case. And all of any timelines need to account for trauma, um, because that is something we are, we have set up the laws around asylum, where in order to get asylum, you basically have to have experienced trauma. And that is, so we need to just assume that, that this person has trauma, and that's going to take time to navigate. Um, deadlines should be waived or exempted if the reason for the deadline was outside of their control. One of the things that we were seeing in um, when the asylum processing rule was active was that the people were, uh, the government was mailing their denial packets through USPS, like through the postal system, which adds two to three days. If they're detained, that adds more time. And there was a seven day deadline for a request for re reconsideration. So if you have this deadline that you've put in place, but you can't meet this deadline because it had to take two days to go through ICE detention processing. It had, it had, it had to take three days to go through the postal service. And then you basically have a day to read it and respond. That's not that's not a reasonable deadline, and it should be it should have been waived um, if they if they wanted to file a request request for reconsideration. Um, we shouldn't be holding asylum seekers to the same evidentiary evidentiary standards when they are subject to expedited adjudication timelines. That someone who has eleven days to prepare a case should not have the same evidentiary standards as someone who had five years to prepare their case. Um, one of the things that uh, could be done throughout the government, but in particular in immigration, is establish and increase information sharing. There are a lot of different agencies that work within immigration, and the communicating and miscommunicating between agencies can add significant time. 
um, harmonizing an electronic system across DHS, making sure that like if you fit if you update your address in one agency and it, it, it updates across all of the agencies that it's 2023, this sort of electronic fixes should be in the works. Um, Ensuring accuracy from the beginning can prevent delays down the road. I mentioned mentioned addresses just now. We had an issue uh, last year where a lot of erroneous addresses were inputted at the beginning of the process, and it created lots of issues down the road. And that doesn't need to happen. It adds delays not just for the asylum applicant, not not just has due process concerns for the asylum applicant, but it also causes adds time for for the for the agencies themselves. And I think that add Establishing an interagency task force to develop a trauma-informed adjudication system would also be a great thing to help make everything work more smoothly. Um, finally, USCIS and the immigration courts have finite resources. Increasing these resources through funding and being smart about existing resources is really going to be is really key to making sure that any sort of change actually happens. So I want to zoom back to your initial point about um, expedited adjudication. Jeremy kind of dived into the other side of the coin when a case takes too long, when you're five, 10 years down the road. We, we mentioned the asylum processing rule, but there are other forms of expedited or enhanced expedited removal and some policy changes that really have sped up asylum processing for some individuals. I, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but can you give us some color on, on what those policies look like? Well, so one of the ones that's been established for a while that you that you may, people may have heard of is the dedicated docket system, which is generally about six months um, of a processing time. And we talk about it more in the report. Recent changes um, with the uh, circumvention of lawful pathways or the asylum transit ban, um, mean that that individuals uh, are also they're they're still going through this very quickly, um, but they're going through it kind of before you actually get into the asylum. So I mentioned credible fear interviews beforehand. Um, they're going through the credible fear process very quickly, and they're going and they're they may be. Um, not like you don't they're not doing it they're not having access to a council during this time so like they're going to be detained they might be in cdp custody they might not have access to a council to council even if their families hired one and so all of this is happening within 24 48 hours or two weeks like it's very short periods of time and it is technically like before the actual asylum process usually it's the credible fear process but we're preventing them from applying for asylum in the first place. And that's, that is a problem. So I'm not, I know Alex, you have lots of experience with that. So I'm happy to. Sure, and some of the questions I'm starting to see in the Q and A touch on some of these issues as well. Um, before we fully turn to the Q and A, there is one question that Jeremy, I think you can answer. Um, you're talking about the amount of time that is invested in representing an asylum claim at, at a bare minimum for an experienced attorney being 50 to 75 hours. How can an asylum seeker afford that? Like what does what does that look like? Like how how do folks navigate it? And what happens when the expectation of the amount of time changes? Uh okay. Well, attorneys are going to to differ on, you know, in terms of their answer on this. I can only address myself and my practice. Humanitarian benefits for us has never been a money maker, okay? Uh, it's it is a passion project and part of our overall commitment to provide top-notch removal defense. So needless to say, if you break it down per hour, if we're seeking asylum, uh, the law firm is generating less revenue per hour than if we were pursuing, say, cancellation or fighting uh, the consequences of a criminal conviction for a longtime permanent resident. Um, the So part of it is an effort on our part to make sure that this benefit is realistically available for our clients. And that requires us to uh, make a sacrifice in terms of fees. 
So we try to be we 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 try to be as fair as we can to the client, but also to ourselves and our business. Second, we try to be as generous as possible uh, with the payment plan. So we don't leave it open ended. We try to you know if a fee is a set amount, uh, let's just for simplicity purposes say that something is six thousand dollars. Then we try to set up one thousand a month for six months. Uh, to try to make it realistic. And then finally, uh, during consultations, we remind the the uh, potential client that, you know, they are talking to a private law firm. There are uh, potentially, uh, they're over, uh, they're overwhelmed, but there are organizations out there uh, that could potentially do, handle the case for free or for less cost. We provide them with the names and places of those resources. Um, and, but the main thing we try to do is just to, to give them as much time as possible, but in very black and white terms. Uh, and they're really relying upon their family, uh, family and friends out there in, in their communities uh, for this, especially the first six months before they have a work permit. Uh, but that's just, that is the reality of a system where there is not guaranteed legal representation for asylum seekers, something that our organization, AILA, is trying uh, to change. All really important points, Jeremy, and I think it is important to reflect on the landscape as a whole, right? You have private attorneys that are working in concert with nonprofits and other organizations that are trying to increase access to counsel because, as the report indicates, having representation in these immigration proceedings can be outcome determinative, right? It can be the difference between a yes or a no. And so our, our efforts to work together, um, our efforts at the Immigration Justice Campaign to you know, get lay attorneys who are not immigration professionals involved in, in representation is also a critical way to try to increase access to counsel for those who, who can't afford it. Um, all right, since the Q&A is starting to pop off, I do want to turn there. Um, we're going to turn to some of your questions. As a reminder, if you still have questions occurring to you, please use the Q&A box. We are going to do our absolute best to answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, I have flagged a number of these to, to put to the side for, for both of you. But Amy, I want to start with some low-hanging fruit. Um, what role did the AILA community play in developing this report? I, I saw some of my friends quoted in there, so I'm, I'm interested to hear how, how you did this. So I uh, we developed a survey that uh, and it went out to AILA members and it went out to individuals, to attorneys that work in asylum spaces. So it wasn't just AILA members, but the big push was with AILA members. Um, and the survey was was very long and bless every person who filled it filled it out because it turns out that it's very it's a comp there's a lot of moving parts within asylum within the asylum case and we wanted to be able to get a feel for where the time was being added um and so we had about over 300 individuals filled out the survey and a lot of the quotes that came from the survey were pulled from the the open comment box in there or like comments that on certain questions within the survey I also reached out to several uh, practicing uh, attorneys, including Jeremy, and uh, did, an, did an interview with them to sort of get more color to certain parts of the of the case that you can't quite capture in a survey. And I also interviewed two former asylum officers to get their perspective on the process, and I interviewed a recent a recent asylum grant grant grantee um, who just got their green card based off of asylum and talked about talked to them about their process and what it was like to to go through it they had an attorney and they could they have done it without an attorney like that so they, that's a lot of different moving parts went into that as well as you know some research so but yes the ALA community was very much very much involved in um, making this report happen thank you Amy um Pivoting to you, Jeremy, but I think, Amy, you might have some insight to contribute here as well. You mentioned in passing um, relay interpretation, and we have a question in the chat about 
uh, from an interpreter um, who has seen dozens and dozens of cases and, and has some questions about the importance of a skilled trauma-informed interpreter and best practices for working with an interpreter. First, for those who might not be aware, what is relay interpretation uh, and what kind of challenges might that pose? And then looking into that sort of intersection between trauma-informed care and representation and interpretation. Uh, well, first of all, let me just, for, for those of you that are contemplating this practice, uh, interpretation is one of the, at least in my view, one of the primary challenges. Uh, it is not simply Spanish or, uh, you know, it, it is it is so much more complicated. Uh, just take Haitian cases. We have an incredibly hard time uh, communicating with our Haitian clients because it, in again, this is very localized experience. It is a challenge for us to find that excellent Haitian Creole interpreter. Uh, the one that we can also trust is accurately relaying what we are asking and what they are being told. That's the primary thing that I am concerned about is the accuracy of the translation because again in a defensive practice where you are in a adversarial hearing the government and unfortunately a lot of times the judge likes to play gotcha they like to play gotcha oh you said 2014 in your declaration and you just said 2015 here on the stand and so that's where we get into trouble uh, and so we have gone, we just continue to search uh, for interpreters that we have confidence in. And boy, when we find one, we grab them and hold them, hold them close and make sure that they're adequately compensated for their time and work. Um, that also requires us a lot of times to go uh, with someone that's over the phone or on Zoom uh, because they're just not here locally. Uh, relay very quickly. It is where you can't make the seamless translate uh, transition from the person's native language to English. You have to have something in between because there is not a person that can take you all the way there. So we have a person that has gone uh, that goes from a particular in indigenous language in Guatemala. Uh, that person speaks to. Uh, someone that understands that language and Spanish, and then that person says it in Spanish, and then an interpreter hears that in Spanish and says it in English, and you do that back and forth. And we've had individual hearings in immigration court where we had to do that the entire hearing, uh, but it was necessary because otherwise there was no ability for that person uh, testimony to be understood by anyone in the courtroom. So that's the way we had to do it. Oh, go ahead, Amy, jump just, in. Just a quick thing. Like one of the things that I, uh, that I saw a lot when I was practicing is just like the, the, there's different regional Spanish, for example. And so someone could, um, the trend, the, the asylum seeker could be from, Colombia, but the person translating is from Mexico, and there's different there's different slang, there's different word choices. There's it's a, it's a different, not quite a different language, but if you think about it from an English perspective, there's a difference between saying pants in the U.S. versus pants in the U.K. It's a different definition, and so you're you're missing some of that nuance when you, when there's that cultural level that is not getting translated, and the English language version is the official record. So even when I, I I interned at the immigration court when I was in in law school, and you listen to the transcripts, and even if you understand Spanish, you have to you, you're turning that off. You're just listening to English because that is the official record. So any of those translation errors can have huge impact on the case on the case itself. I think that's a really important issue to to flag, and I think there's there's so much nuance across language. Even thinking about the difference in in Spanish and English. For instance, for an LGBTQ case, right? Use of pronouns or or gen like gender is different in Spanish than it is in England and or, sorry in English. And um, making sure if you, especially if you understand both languages, that the correct translation comes across 
in the transcript and in the English version is, is incredibly important. Um, Amy, we touched on this in passing, but I, again, want to zoom out to, to big picture, especially for, for folks who might not be immigration practitioners or, or familiar with asylum proceedings. What is the difference between expedited removal um, and normal removal proceedings? So expedited removal is when you are picked up at the border or within 100 miles of the border within 14 days. You're put into a different process, different different uh, steps apply. Like this, a lot of the recent changes on the Islam transit ban, they're going to apply to them um, more aggressively. So it's a different, it's very hard for individuals that are in expedited removal to access an attorney because it is happening so quickly. Um, but that is where the difference is, is where they were picked up and when they were picked up. Um, if you were picked, if you entered without uh, inspection and then aren't picked up for a year or two, then then you're going to be in regular removal proceedings, not expedited removal. Thank you, Amy. Um, I want to touch on this question because I think it gets to to your point, Jeremy, about what could be changed um, in 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 asylum law, the, the kind of concept of, of PSGs. We have a question from the Q&A. Um, why is the process of asylum created, you know, post-World War II, um, where we're, we're, we're fleeing government persecutors, uh, when we're now looking at a world where so many persecutors are, are cartels or non-government actors or multinational gangs? Like, how do we reconcile the origin story of our current framework with the reality that asylum seekers are now confronting? Well, in part, you do that through what this administration has been promising us for a couple of years now, and that is providing a regulatory definition of what is a member of a particular social group. What you saw in the last administration through cases like Matter of AB uh, and uh, Matter of LEA uh, are cases, an attempt from uh, the last administration to really significantly narrow private persecution, non-governmental actors. Uh, you even had dicta in matter of AB that said most domestic cases and most gang cases will fail, even though matter of AB was not even a gang case. Uh, and so you had those types of, of, um, really uh, restrictive interpretations of asylum law that uh, held for several years until a change of administration. Now that goes back to the lack of independence of our immigration courts, because as soon as we switched from Trump to Biden, you then saw the, the pendulum swing where all of these cases that uh, Trump attorneys general decided were then vacated by Attorney General Garland. Uh, and so, and again, that can go back the other way. If if we don't have a good result next year in the next presidential election, that should not be for asylum case law. You need clarity and uniformity. And most importantly, it needs to be nonpartisan, not bipartisan, nonpartisan, because it has to do with the law, humanitarian law, and it should not be about partisan politics. Uh, and so we really need political independence within uh, within immigration law, especially within asylum law. And we need a bit more regulatory clarity of some of these terms to bring in the reality of today, which is private persecution. And then to lawmakers that want to complain about our asylum laws, either way, you know, that they're too lax or they're too um, restrictive. Well, you're in Congress. How about we change the law? You can actually change the statute if, if you're not a fan of the statute, but that requires this little thing called legislation and cooperation uh, to do that. So uh, in the interim, in the absence of Congress being able to do anything big, uh, we need regulatory reform and we need court independence. There, there is a regulation that the Biden administration mentioned at the beginning of their of their term uh, the, that would uh, make PSG a, a, a standardize it across the agencies, but it has yet to be actually released. And so one of the recommendations in the report was actually 
let's let's actually release this this regulation on to standardize the PSG process for all the reasons that you're talking about, Jeremy. That's right. We've been waiting since February 2nd, 2021 with bated breath for for clarity on what particular social group um, should mean. Um, all right, another question. Jeremy, we talked a little bit about how the entire field needs to work together collaboratively to support asylum seekers. A, a question from the Q&A touching on that, Amy, and I, I invite you to join as well. Can pro se asylum clinics be useful in helping asylum seekers, uh, knowing that this is a cumbersome process? Um, I think this question kind of gets at, you know, there's a difference between competent counsel and help, right? And people need support. What is the bare minimum? What can we do for folks that are not represented? Uh, well, on the question, I'm, I'm super interested in Amy's answer to this because I find like a kind of mass clinic for uh, open-ended clinic for people to have those conversations to be particularly dangerous uh, because, again, there are questions about privilege, attorney-client privilege, and about having a meaningful conversation on an important subject when there's volume there. Um, what we try to do instead is uh, schedule people for actual consultations, but where it merits it, just to extend those consultations pro bono. We'll have a free conversation about it, but it will be an individualized asylum consultation. I, I just think that um, the, the clinic role in terms of like a screening process, um, there may be some utility there. I just haven't seen it. But again, I Amy's experience might be different. So I think that there's a there's, there's balance here because we have a we have a problem of the one year filing deadline for asylum seekers. So when that you have we have one year and there's there's some nuance in there, but generally speaking, you have one year to file your asylum application. And and it usually when you just arrive, you're like finding a place to live, you're getting your kids enrolled in school, you're like you're feeding yourself. Like there's all these other things that come in, come that take priority over finding an attorney and filing an application. I think there's space for developing a clinic in a smart way where to get an application, like even a bare bones application filed, um, kind of similar. Like I know when I was, when I was practicing in Boston, we had a citizenship clinic and they had the, the nonprofit did the initial screening and they did, and they did the initial like intake form. And then volunteer attorneys would sit there and like, and, and paralegals would sit there and like actually fill out the application and review it and do the last steps right before it like went back to be sent out. And so I think that a model like that, like there, it might be possible to create that, but it would, it would need to be one of those like nonprofit and private bar partnership situations. Um, because there are like Jeremy said, there's a lot of concerns of, about saying like, you say something in your initial application and it can be a problem down the road. Like you, you want to make sure you have the right information in that application. Yeah, you guys touch on some of the, the key tensions and I think it's really critical to think about what best practices look like and what, what can be shared in a group setting, right? Like if we're kind of like this, trying to touch on high level, non-case specific information so that people walk away with a general understanding and learning of what asylum is, but then any work would be done one on one that's different. And I think, you know, to, to Jeremy's broader point, like what we're all aiming for is universal representation, right? People should have attorneys. But what do we do in the interim to make sure that folks get some of the help they need if they're not going to get any help whatsoever? And, and it's it's really hard. Um all right, this one is a, a tough one. I think maybe from a friend of mine here in Arizona. Um, are people in Mexico that are applying for asylum actually refugees according to the definition uh, because they're outside of the US? I assume here we're talking a little bit about some of these border externalization processes where folks have been bumped back into Mexico like the now defunct migrant protection protocols um, or, or other processes. What, what do folks, what do folks think? 
I, I, I mean, I literally typed that they're seeking asylum uh, because the adjudicatory process and the application is within the United States, even if the person is technically standing in Mexico when they make the application. What happens even during uh, MPP is that they were admitted into the port of entry area, into the tent court or whatever was operating to adjudicate those claims. And that claim was being adjudicated within the United States. So it, I still view it as asylum. And importantly, the refugee process is completely separate. We have some resources on that that we can we can add to the chat as well. Um, on the last question, we touched on the one year filing deadline a little bit. We do have a question in the Q and A about that one year bar. Can asylum seekers uh, apply for asylum after their their one year has lapsed? I didn't know which way that was going, but I, I, anyone in the room, yeah. <laughs> I okay. So the answer is yes, of course. And first of all, understand that there are a, there are exceptions to this rule. So, for example, uh, if you are a minor, uh, if you're a minor, that one year rule does not apply to you. Uh, if you were in the United States in some type of lawful status that could could uh, create an exceptional circumstance for you to file later. The bottom line is, if you want an exception to apply to you, the question is, was the delay, uh, was there an exceptional circumstance for the delay? And did you, um, was the time in which you applied reasonable? Uh, and so, uh, that requires, you know, in many cases, I think, Alex, to your earlier point, representation, because that question can be very complicated. Uh, and so that's a key thing. If if you're simply late and that's found by the either USCIS asylum or an immigration judge, uh, then the person is left with potentially withholding of removal, which has an increased burden of proof. Uh, clear probability of persecution, uh, and it doesn't allow for uh, derivatives. So kids don't automatically get the status because mom got the status. And then potentially most importantly, it never leads to permanent residence, unlike asylum. So uh, being on time is critical and uh, just simply submitting that application, even if it's not fully fleshed out, just to get it in on time is 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 so so important. What, sorry, one of the things I'd add to that is that uh, I heard from a lot of attorneys that their experience was that USCIS would, if it was over the one year deadline, they that they made the officer may not even deal with that at all. They would just refer it to the immigration court, even if there were arguments for the one year deadline exception. And that practice adds time to the pro whole process um, because the immigration court now has to deal with it. And the immigration court is also backlogged. If we empower USCIS officers to deal with the one, to actually engage with the one-year rule and the and the exceptions to that, then we make it easier for, for the immigration court. Like it's, it's not, you can't think about this as one agency. You have to think about this as all of these different agencies working together. All right, we have dozens of questions left and three minutes left in the hour. So I'd love to leave us on kind of like a, a positive, what can people do note? We have a question in the Q&A um, for new practitioners in immigration. Um, what do you recommend as a good starting point to learn about immigration law quickly and efficiently? Uh, I think, Jeremy, maybe, maybe you on this one. Well, <clears throat> I'm somewhat biased <laughs> as the immediate past president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, but I, I will just tell you from my own personal uh, practice, I started as a criminal defense attorney and quickly saw a need for immigration legal services in my area. And the first attorney I spoke to about this uh, said, you need to join ALA. Uh, really, joining AILA was a life-changing experience for me. 
Uh, and I think that that experience has been duplicated thousands of times over uh, because it really places you in a network of individuals uh, of all skill levels that can assist you. You find that person that you trust to ask your stupid questions of, you know, that safe space. And I don't mean that literally stupid. They're not stupid questions. They're just rookie questions. They're new questions. But you find that safe space to ask those questions. You can find that with an ALA. Uh, not to mention uh, resources like Dree's book on asylum. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, and so, and then the council as well has all of these different practice advisories and resources. So the home is Ayla and the council uh, to really get you up to speed and to put you in a network of caring professionals uh, that are going to help elevate your practice and make you uh, hopefully a rock star in this field. Thank you so much, Jeremy and Amy. We are at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you to all of you who have joined today's uh, webinar. We hope that you found the presentation informative and engaging. As a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be emailed to all registrants very soon. We have other webinars planned in the future, so please keep your eyes peeled for any upcoming invitations. Um, also, for those of you who are asking about how to get involved or ways you can contribute, please consider donating to the council, the, uh, the American Immigration Council or Justin, Justice Action Center. We will share links there for people who are volunteer minded. The Immigration Justice Campaign also does place uh, pro bono cases and also has some needs for non-expert, non-attorney volunteers in particular if you speak other languages. We can share resources on that as well. In addition, Amy flagged this in the chat. If you are an attorney, ALA's hybrid fall conference is on September 29th in the lovely state of Arizona, where I find myself. She has shared a link in the chat. Um, thank you again so much for joining and thank you to the speakers.